Today we're going to be talking about appetite. So this is the phenomenon of being hungry and eating. This is obviously something that most of us do uh, and think about an awful lot, but we don't necessarily think about what are the what's happening inside us to drive these changes in our attitudes towards food go, uh, from uh, hour to hour and within a day. So we're going to talk about that today. There's some important terms that we need to define with respect to eating. First is satiety. So that is the feeling of fulfillment or satisfaction. So if you've eaten a big meal, you are satiated and you are experiencing satiety. Of course, then there's also hunger, which is essentially the opposite of satiety. That is the internal state of an animal seeking food. We're all very familiar with this uh, feeling. The brain integrates a whole bunch of different signals, insulin and blood glucose being two of the most important. Um, these levels change as uh, pre-eating, post-eating, and there's also a bunch of additional information which we will talk about. And this uh, provides the, uh, uh, informs the decision of whether we need to initiate eating or say stop eating. Given the importance of eating to survival, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise that there isn't any one single brain region that has master control over appetite. The hypothalamus, however, uh, has several subregions that are very important for the regulation of, of eating and, um, and, uh, and satiety. So there are areas that are heavily involved with metabolic rate, food intake, and also areas and different mechanisms that even regulate our body weight. So this is a figure that uh, shows changes in two counterbalancing signals over the course of a day that will uh, regulate when we eat. Blood glucose is monitored by receptors in the stomach, liver, and intestines. As uh, these hormones, uh, there are hormones that are released from the gut and they act on the brain. Both of these things, in addition to a few other things, these are signals that get sent to the hypothalamus to indicate hunger. And then when these signals, so blood glucose levels going down, hormones being released from various gut uh, structures, acting on the brain that will induce food seeking behavior. It's late at night, you've been out studying, um, you're super hungry, so you order in a pizza. That, uh, that is food seeking behavior. These signals, like blood glu glucose changes, these hormonal changes, these are known as orexogenic signals. Orexi means to eat, and orexogenic means it's generating the need to eat. So as you can see, after you've eaten a meal, so the dark line is food consumption, so this is when you have eaten a meal, meal time right here. After you've eaten a meal, your orexogenic signals are very low. Over time, you start to consume, your body uh, breaks apart the food that you've eaten and uses up the energy. And then eventually your blood glucose starts to go down and you start to have an increase in erectogenic signals. Eventually it gets to a threshold where, okay, I am super hungry. Now I got to go to Taco Bell and get some cheap tacos. And that is going to be the food seeking behavior and erectogenic signals only start to go down once you start to eat. On the other side of this uh, is the satiety signals. So as food fills the stomach, stretch receptors provide signals to the hypothalamus. Other hormones from the gut and fat slow feeding, and these signals are sent to the hypothalamus to indicate a feeling of fullness and satisfaction. So during mealtime, you start eating, your gut stretches, and then you have these satiety signals that will increase, and then that's telling you that you're feeling full. So that's, you know, you eat a big old Benny's pizza, like two slices of Benny's pizzas, plenty, and you will have um, a substantial increase in your satiety signals. It's gonna give you that, that feeling of satisfaction and feeling full, and that increase will tell you that it's time to stop eating. And, you know, we can only get so full, most of us anyway. I, I tend to push that uh, limit myself. So you can see that the arrestogenic signals and the satiety signals are kind of inverse, that in the time between meals, Satiety signals go down because you're feeling less and less full, and orexogenic signals go up and up and up. And then they only reverse when you start to eat. And once you've 
have eaten a meal, now they are opposite. Erectogenic signals are at their lowest, and satiety signals are at their highest. So we're going to talk about the details of these signals and how it gets integrated in the brain for the rest of the, today's presentation. So there are uh, several hormones that we're going to be discussing, uh, some of which we're going to be discussing in, in great detail. So this is a table that gives us a nice overview of what this looks like. A lot of these hormones arise from the gut. There's one that arises from the hypothalamus that regulates uh, eating behavior. Um, so yeah, orexin is one that arises from the hypothalamus. It increases hunger, orexin, orexi, remember, means to eat. So it's a hormone called orexin. We also have ghrelin, which is uh, from the stomach that increases hunger. Insulin, which we actually aren't going to discuss in any great detail, um, but this, as it increases, um, it comes from the pancreas, and that also increases hunger. We will talk about leptin, which arises from fat. That decreases hunger. And then we have PYY, which um, decreases hunger, but it does it in a slightly different way. It arises from the digestive tract. So this, this has a slightly different mechanism. So why don't we get into it and discuss some of these in detail? There are several brain areas, uh, subnuclei within the hypothalamus that we're going to be discussing today. One is the lateral hypothalamus. Another is the ventral medial hypothalamus. A very important nucleus is the arcuate nucleus. And we will also be discussing the paraventricular nucleus again. So this is related to stress, but it also has a role in appetite. We're going to, you will see over the next several lectures that the paraventricular nucleus actually is very multimodal. It has neurons that are involved in all kinds of functions. The arcuate nucleus is critical to regulating overall satiety and eating. It acts as an appetite controller, and it's governed by hormones like insulin um, and a few other ones. So the arcuate appetite system relies on two sets of neurons with opposing effects. There are two main types of neurons. Um, there's one set of neurons that are NPY positive and agouti related peptide positive, that's AGRP. Um, NPY is neuropeptide Y. So these neurons are producing these, these uh, labels and it's just one way of identifying them. They play a very important role in regulating how these neurons work, but we're not gonna get into that. We're just gonna understand that this is just one class of neurons, sort of like the enkephalin and dynorphin positive medium spiny neurons in the striatum. These, this is a class of neurons that expresses these proteins, and so we can identify them in that way. These neurons act to stimulate appetite, and they lower metabolism, and they promote weight gain. There's a different set of neurons also within the arcuate that produce POMC and CART, cocaine and amphetamine-related transcript. So again, these are just labels. Um, the... Uh, um, they're both, the, both of these are very important peptides and they do play an important role in feeding as well as other things, but, uh, that isn't specifically what these are, are, we're not talking about the details of these at all. Again, this, this is just, we're categorizing these neurons. So we have NPY, agouti related protein neurons and POMC CART neurons. These neurons work to inhibit appetite and raise metabolism, promoting weight loss. So we have two neurons that seem to do opposite, um, effects within the arcuate. So those are the, the um, there are two main functions of these, of these two groups of neurons. Some of the projections stay within the arcuate and they influence each other's activity. They kind of have a yin-yang organization, which we'll talk about in a little detail in the um, next couple of slides. Uh, there are other projections that leave the arcuate and they make connections for other nuclei in the hypothalamus, including the paraventricular nucleus and the lateral hypothalamus. This slide is illustrating a diagram that we will be revisiting over and over again as we go through the four main hormones that we'll be focusing on today. It's illustrating three of the four subnuclei of the hypothalamus that we'll be discussing. So here's the arcuate, and this is illustrating those two categories of neurons, the NPY AGRP neurons and the POMC CART neurons. And you can see that they have reciprocal connections to each other where they would be influencing the activity of each other. The NPY 
uh, agouti-related protein neurons, they connect to the paraventricular nucleus. They also project over into the, um, the lateral hypothalamus. The kind of neurotransmitter that they release onto these um, neurons actually is, it does involve the release of NPY. So it's not exactly a classic glutamatergic GABAergic type mechanism. So we're not going to get into the details of the um, excitatory and inhibitory connections. The, the, the connections that are happening between the nuclei here are actually relatively complicated. So we're not necessarily going to focus on that part. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to illustrate for you what our understanding of these connections are. We, the POMC CART neurons, you can see, have direct connections to the lateral hypothalamus, which is orexigenic, and that these neurons are obviously downstream of the arcuate. The arcuate is a hormone-sensitive nucleus. It's sensitive to um, a, a bunch of different hormones, including leptin, insulin, ghrelin, and P -P PYY. So we will be walking through these. Ghrelin is a, and, and we're going to walk through them quickly here and then go in a little bit more detail for the rest of the presentation. Ghrelin is released by the stomach and it increases hunger. So it acts on the, uh, the arcuate. Leptin is released by fat cells and it decreases hunger. PYY uh, is released by the intestines. It also decreases hunger, particularly around feelings of disgust and taste aversion. And then orexin is a hormone that is produced by the lateral hypothalamus. It increases appetite and food intake by suppressing inhibitory post-ingestive feedback. So we're going to walk through these over the next several slides. Dang it. All right. Ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone. It was originally identified a little over 20 years ago now, um, and its importance has only become more and more clear over um, years and years of, uh, since, since it was originally identified. So it's a peptide hormone that's released from the cells of the stomach. It increases during fasting and decreases after a meal. The way it works is that it's based on stretch receptors. So the stomach itself is releasing ghrelin, and it releases more and more ghrelin as the stomach empties. So as food is, is um, moved from the stomach into the intestines, eventually ghrelin in concentrations increase more and more, it's released into the bloodstream, and then it acts on multiple brain areas, including the arcuate nucleus, as well as the lateral hypothal hypothalamic area. Increased ghrelin levels, that increases orexigenic, that's an, that is an orexigenic signal, and it increases appetite. When you eat and you have that feeling of satiation and you are experiencing satiety, your stomach stretches and that decreases ghrelin release from the stomach. So then your ghrelin decreases and then this is going to, to remove an arrestogenic signal which will allow for satiation to occur. We know that when we treat rats with ghrelin, acutely, we give them a big injection of uh, ghrelin, it stimulates food intake and growth hormone release. And the chronic ghrelin administration causes weight gain. So rats that are getting too much ghrelin all the time, that is, we know that it uh, is, is acting directly to cause uh, animals to eat, and they overeat, and then they gain weight. Intravenous infusion of subcutaneous injection of ghrelin uh, to humans increases feelings of hunger as well as food intake. So there's experiments that show that as well. Obese individuals tend to have low baseline levels of ghrelin and the levels do not drop after a meal. So no signal for just ate a meal occurs. So their overall ghrelin system is largely disturbed. It's uh, lost its ability to maintain homeostasis. So the levels are relatively low, but they never ever really get a drop. So they've lost sort of ghrelin sensitivity. And also one thing that happens with obesity is that the stomach tends to be permanently stretched because of overeating. And so then the, um, um, that just leads to um, a decrease in ghrelin all the time. So they never get this 
surge of ghrelin that that uh, that they should normally have, and then that changes the overall homeostasis mechanisms within the brain. So ghrelin acts onto the hypothalamus, of course, and it acts primarily through the arcuate nucleus. Ghrelin stimulates the NPY AGRP neurons, and this increases appetite. So as ghrelin goes up, it stimulates these neurons, which then increases appetite. So it'll act onto the lateral hypothalamus, which then induces um, the, uh, the release of orexin. And um, eventually this makes its way to the nucleus of the solitary tract and, um, and then influences our need to eat. The other thing is that the um, when these neurons are stimulated, the, RQ, the NPY agouti-related protein neurons are stimulated, it's also going to serve to suppress the POMC CART neurons, which inhibit appetite. So this is part of that yin-yang kind of mechanism that's within the arcuate. So if there's a factor in here, like ghrelin, so you're getting, your stomach is empty, it, your, your concentrations of ghrelin are increasing, it stimulates these neurons to be active, making you feel hungry, it also simultaneously suppresses the POMC CART neurons. The idea of treating individuals who are struggling with weight gain or weight, uh, too much weight uh, and losing weight um, via modifications to the ghrelin system has been an area of active research for ever since its discovery. Because of these observations of altered ghrelin levels and ghrelin function in obese individuals, there have been ideas used to try to to modify the receptor signaling as a way, as a way of preventing obesity. Um, it's been shown that in rats, that if you vaccinate rats against ghrelin, so giving stimulating the immune system to knock down ghrelin, that can reduce weight gain. So if the ghrelin is being blocked by the immune system, ghrelin can't get up to the brain, and therefore you don't have as much orexogenesis occurring, and animals don't eat as much. It remains to be shown, however, that blocking ghrelin signaling is a viable long-term uh, obesity therapy in humans. It just There's been various studies, and none of them have really truly panned out. Ghrelin agonists might also be useful uh, in the treatment of specific patients of, uh, um, who are struggling with anorexia, a condition that we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail towards the end of, the, of this presentation. Also, Ghrelin levels appear to be influenced by environmental factors, such as how much or how little sleep an individual gets. So if you're getting enough sleep, you have relatively low ghrelin, which means you have a normal appetite. Um, but uh, leptin is also affected as well. But with not enough sleep, you have high ghrelin, and that tends to make you very hungry because you have too much ghrelin, and your leptin levels are messed up as well. So get enough sleep. Don't stay up too late watching Netflix. Leptin is another critical hormone that uh, regulates the um, balance of orexogenesis and satiety, hunger and feeling satiated. Fat cells produce leptin and they secrete it into the bloodstream. So, um, and leptin is, works to suppress hunger by acting on receptors in the hypothalamus. So it acts on leptin receptors in the arcuate nucleus. When you eat, you will have um, energy being produced. These two factors are sensed by adipose tissue, the fat. And um, within tens of minutes, you will have an increase of secretion of leptin. Leptin circulates around the body, acts on the brain, and tells you, hey, you know what? You have eaten quite a bit. Maybe you don't need to eat as much anymore, and you start to feel satiated. The arcuate, again, is a center for leptin and how it acts on the brain and to regulate feeding behavior. Leptin acts on the POMC CART neurons. So it stimulates the POMC CART neurons that inhibits the NPY agouti related protein neurons. And then that system, then once these neurons are activated, it, it changes the balance of power. So ghrelin decreases, leptin increases, changes the balance so that you start to feel satiated and then that suppresses hunger. And leptin's effects on the arcuate are actually long lasting. They can last for hours and hours, even after leptin levels have started to go down. 
Leptin and ghrelin play opposite roles. Leptin and ghrelin are two hormones that have been recognized to have a major influence on overall energy balance. Leptin is a mediator of long-term regulation of energy balance, suppressing food intake, and thereby inducing weight loss. And ghrelin is a fast-acting hormone, seemingly playing a role in meal initiation. These things are in balance. So, um, and you can really think of like a teeter-totter as um, where the balance is, uh, is weighted, right? So if you have a lot of ghrelin, your stomach is relatively empty, uh, and it's pumping out a ton of ghrelin, you have not eaten recently, your leptin levels are relatively low. So leptin uh, is, is not weighing down here, and ghrelin instead is pushing down on the teeter-totter, and the balance, the scale is pushed on this direction, you're going to have feelings of hunger. As you eat, your stomach stretches, ghrelin levels go down, and the the food uh, the food acts on your fat cells uh, to in, to induce the secretion of leptin, which then acts on the arcuate, shifting that balance from the NPY agouti related protein neurons to to be more focused on the POMC cart neurons, and then leptin is now taking tipping the scale so that um, uh, that now you feel satiated and you no longer feel hungry. So this kind of balance of leptin and ghrelin is really key to how um, these two factors um, have direct uh, and inverse roles in the regulation of satiety and hunger. And you can see that one promotes it, the other suppresses hunger, and that the act of feeding creates the opposite change in the change in levels. Ghrelin is high when you're hungry and low when you after you eat. Leptin is low before you eat and increases after you've eaten. The third hormone we're going to discuss today is PYY. This is known as peptide tyrosine tyrosine. Y is the symbol for tyrosine, so it's a very short symbol. Um, a very small peptide produced by the small intestines from cells uh, within the ileum and the colon. It has very low baseline levels that increase quickly when eating. So when PYY levels increase, it decreases appetite. Really high levels of PYY have been reported to cause uh, conditioned taste aversion in animals, which we're gonna talk about over the next couple of slides, and nausea in humans. Receptors the four PYY are located in the arcuate nucleus and the vagus nerve input to the brainstem. So um, this feeling of satiety, um, the uh, PYY plays a role in that. So as food makes its way into the lower gut, um, you're going to have an increase in PYY, and that will act on the act on the arcuate to reduce the um, feelings of hunger and increase the feelings of satiety. So this is a, a meal-related afferent signal coming from the gut to act on the brain. The way PYY works is that it inhibits, directly inhibits, these NPY AGRP neurons. Remember, the NPY AGRP neurons, uh, they normally work to stimulate appetite. When ghrelin is really, really high, it acts on these neurons to induce them to, to, um, uh, to induce hunger and to induce eating. But when you eat, PYY goes up, it acts on the arcuate and on this class of neurons to actually inhibit it. So you, now you have two factors working in opposition. When you eat, leptin levels go up and it activates the POMC cart neurons, which will serve to suppress these neurons through this action. But then you also have PYY coming in here to suppress the same neurons. So it's getting a double whammy of suppression, which is going to increase satiety. Taste aversion is a mechanism that is used by virtually all animals to, to tell us that something that we may think ha is good to eat actually is not good to eat. You may eat something, you might not know that it's, say, it's spoiled or that it has toxins in it. You have to learn these things, typically, and your brain will then tell you, okay, uh, 
maybe I shouldn't eat this next time. So all of us have probably experienced this. I have experienced it myself. Uh, when I was a little kid, um, like when I was four years old, I loved bananas. Um, I would eat bananas all the time. It was one of the foods that I could always be trusted to eat. I got sick. I had a really bad case of pneumonia when I was four and I had to take like five different medicines, several of which were like several teaspoons that I had to take each time. And the very first time I had to take all the medicines, uh, it really made me sick. I just felt sick to my stomach. And I knew, you know what? Eating a banana always makes me feel good. So I'm going to eat a banana because so, I just don't feel so good. I put that banana in my mouth. I started eating it. But because I had already had that feeling of, of, of being ill and feeling stomach sick, I immediately threw up. And that incident, that one incident alone, made me fear bananas. I no longer can eat bananas all the way up to this day, even though that was 30 some years ago, I uh, still have a very strong taste aversion to bananas. In fact, even just talking about it makes me feel sick. These are experiences that our brain takes in, implants them, and uh, ensures that whatever this bad experience we had, we're not going to repeat it. Even if our brain, and I cognitively, I know it was the medicine that made me sick, made me feel ill, but somehow it is entrained in my brain that bananas are going to make me sick and I'm not going to ever eat a banana again if I can help it. Animals take advantage of this. Really bright coloration for insects in particular is used as a signal telling predators to not eat them. So we all know what a monarch is. This is a monarch butterfly, very beautiful, um, famous butterfly. Uh, makes these long treks across the United States down into Mexico. Um, they're pretty extraordinary creatures, right? And we also know that they eat milkweed. That's the other thing. And w some of you may know this, but when a monarch is a caterpillar and it's chomping on milkweed, uh, it, it can eat this milkweed because it is filled with a, a poison called a cardinalide. And um, it sequesters this poison. So it processes it and it sequesters it and stores it in its body. And it's a very disgusting taste and it will make you sick if you eat it. Thus, monarchs can have this really bright coloration when they are adults. And they will still keep the, uh, the poison in their body even as an adult. And, um, and it'll make, and it'll make it clear to animals like, you know what, I probably shouldn't eat them. Interestingly, there are a bunch of different species of milkweeds. Okay. So there's one species that's particularly rich in this. A lot of the milkweeds are, this is one species. This is a, a Mexican milkweed. Um, it, it is, it is very rich in the cardinalide and, um, right. So you can raise monarchs on this species. So you you, you um, have the monarch lay eggs, the caterpillars delete the leaves, and when they are adults, they will be very poisonous. There are a few milkweeds, uh, part of the milkweed family, that are free of the cardinalide. And uh, so this is one of the species. If you raise monarchs on this species, they are not poisonous. So um, some very famous experiments that were done in the 70s uh, were, were done to test this idea of, of taste aversion and uh, visual signaling of, of, hey, don't eat me. Um, these scientists raised a bunch of monarchs that fed on the non-poisonous um, milkweed. And then of course they had some monarchs that were poisonous. And what they did is they collected a bunch of blue jays brought them into aviaries and um, raised them up. These blue jays were fed a whole bunch of non-poisonous monarchs. Monarchs that were raised on the, uh, the, the cardinalide free milkweed. So then the monarchs, uh, these blue jays learned that, hey, really bright orange color means tasty snack. So they were more than happy to eat these. Then they switched them over to um, feed on one 
monarch that was uh, raised on the the toxic um, milkweed. Okay. So these blue jays brought into these arenas and fed the non-poisonous monarchs for a long time, learned to hunt down the monarchs and eat them. The And here you can see this is a blue jay eating one of these monarchs. But when they were given one of the poisonous monarchs just once, after 30 minutes, they threw up. And this is a picture of this blue jay 30 minutes later uh, tossing his cookies and throwing up the monarch. So it made him very sick because it, it ingested the cardinalide and now is throwing up. This is the mechanism of taste aversion. And it is thought that this disgusting feeling that you have when you eat something that is toxic or that you just are having some bad stomach feeling with like if you have norovirus or something else that makes you feel sick, if you tend to eat something during that time, you can develop taste aversion. PYY is thought to be a critical component of that. So that feeling of stomach sickness Part of that is just PYY that is uh, very high levels of PYY that's acting on the brain. And then that very, very high level of PYY is entrained as a memory, a permanent, very strong, long lasting memory that can last for years and years or decades in my case, where you will no longer want to eat that toxic item. Even fooling your brain into thinking that these items are no longer good to eat. So the last hormone we're going to talk about is orexin. So we're going to discuss some of the brain areas that are involved with this. Um, one thing that we have learned, so the lateral hypothalamus, we've already talked about, receives inputs from both of the subsets of neurons in the arcuate. So the lateral hypothalamus is clearly an important part of the orexogenesis and regulating overall uh, hunger. Um, it, it can regulate in a bunch of different ways. We know that if you stimulate the lateral hypothalamus, so if you place an electrode in the lateral hypothalamus, you can induce hunger. Animals will start to want to eat if you stimulate this brain area. Low blood glucose levels, so like after a long time after eating, your blood glucose levels will go down. This will stimulate the lateral hypothalamus to produce and release the hormone orexin and this triggers eating. So then orexin will circulate around the brain, act on different brain areas in order to induce those to say, hey, you know what, I really am hungry. I probably should get something to eat. When you destroy the lateral hypothalamus, animals lose their interest in eating. The ventral medial hypothalamus serves to suppress hunger. When you destroy the ventral medial hypothalamus, the animal tends to eat excessively, thereby developing extreme obesity. This is a picture of a mouse. Trust me, it's a mouse. It looks like uh, um, a mouse that's two or three times its normal body weight. This animal had a lesion of the ventral medial hypothalamus, the VMH, and it just eats and eats and eats and ends up developing obesity. So it seems like the lesions of LH and VMH, um, th these kinds of experiments where we've lesioned one or the other demonstrates that, the, that these two nuclei seem to work and to counterbalance each other. When you destroy the lateral hypothalamus or the LH, animals no longer have an interest in eating and they lose weight. This is also referred to as lateral hypothalamic syndrome. And in fact, this is a condition in humans. When you destroy the ventral medial hypothalamus, it leads to the animal to eat excessively and developing obesity. This is ventral medial hypothalamic syndrome. So these two nuclei serve as counterbalance of maintaining uh, um, the orexigenesis and satiety signals so that you can maintain normal body weight. There's some really interesting features to this though that can happen um, illustrating these changes. And it looks like that the ventral medial hypothalamus serves to set, establish a certain baseline of overall satiety. And the lateral hypothalamus is, itself also serves to, to maintain a, a certain baseline. So I'm going to walk through this in some detail, um, looking at the changes in weight gain and loss in three different groups of rats. So first is a normal rat. So these rats have 
uh, an intact VMH and an intact LH. And its weight is a little bit more than 200 grams. And so over time, period of days, um, maybe even weeks in this case, its weight is more or less the same. It doesn't really change. When you put these animals through a period of food deprivation, so they don't have as much food to eat throughout the day, it's not given to them freely. Instead, they're given periods of time when they can eat and then the food is taken away, they will lose some weight. So not enough food, they're going to lose a little bit of weight. Then when you put them back on their regular diet of having as much food as they want, um, normal, regular, healthy food, then they gain some of that weight back and then they maintain their normal body weight. When you give normal rats very rich food, such as candy or peanut butter, things that are really high in calories and that are very tasty and delicious to eat, the rats tend to overeat and they gain weight. Then when you take away those very rich, uh, tasty foods, then they establish normal weight uh, uh, again. It is this process um, that we can see that, you know, probably all of us have, have dealt with and struggled with at time to time or at the very least, you know people who have, and that periods of food deprivation, you go on a diet, you lose weight. But of course, if you go off your diet and you start eating the way you did, you gain some of it back. And if you um, eat a lot of, uh, you go through a period of, uh, say, a quarantine and you're ordering too many pizzas and getting too many bags of chips and cookies, um, you, had, you tend to gain weight. And then, um, then let's say you get your act together and you are just going back to not eating such unhealthy foods, you lose weight and get back to your normal weight. This is very typical for many of us, right? And rats are really aren't all that different. Interestingly, when you have lesions of these different areas, let's take LH lesion rats for, uh, to begin with, those animals will have a, a new threshold where they just don't simply eat enough. And you can see overall, their weight is just less. In fact, it's like about a third less of what it should be. So these rats are thin. They are underweight, but they can maintain that weight. And when they go through a period of food deprivation, they can get dangerously thin, uh, but they will lose weight. If you give them rich foods, they will eat too much and they will gain weight. Um, and so, but they're constantly maintaining their weight at this overall new normal. VMH lesion rats, on the other hand, we saw that they're grossly overweight. In fact, almost like double of the weight that there should be, they can go through these th same changes of food deprivation and eating rich foods where they lose and gain weight respectively. So what this is illustrating is, is a couple of things. One, VMH leads to obesity, changing the threshold so that things are very, very high, and that LH lesions leads to being too thin and not eating enough. However, the context of what's happening for the food experience that each animal is experiencing must be regulated by different mechanisms. It's not VMH or LH because all three groups of animals still will lose weight when they don't have enough food and they will gain weight when they are given very rich food. So they're still able to have some of these changes, but instead it looks like the VMH and LH both serve to maintain some sort of baseline normal weight. And that when you interfere with one or the other, you are now changing that baseline. Now we're going to talk a little bit about eating disorders. Um, these are very common issues. Most, many, many people struggle with eating disorders of some kind. There's, um, of the severe eating, eating disorders, it, it tends to affect women more than men. Uh, in fact, it's a 10 to 1 ratio of eating disorders. Um, it's something that tends to be very high amongst very young people, um, teenagers, um, nearly 50% of teenage girls and 33% of teenage boys. They use unhealthy weight control behaviors such as fasting, vomiting, or smoking cigarettes just to keep thin. Um, the, uh, 35% of normal dieters, um, so with this obsession over eating, they can sometimes lead to pathological dieting, such as vomiting or fasting. And, um, and then of those, about a quarter of those will progress to partial or full-time syndrome eating disorders. And that's where that 10 million number comes in. The, this is not a trivial issue. Eating disorders actually have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. It's a, for those individuals who are suffering from these major eating disorders, 
they uh, it's a very serious issue and it can be utterly deadly. So for people who are trying to maintain a very, very low body weight, um, uh, many of them, it is a super high risk of, of death. So let's talk about anorexia. Uh, anorexia nervosa is the technical term. It's a condition in which normal weight person, again, like this is something that often more affects women than men, may not necessarily because of biological issues. There's a lot of cultural issues involved with this as well, um, where they uh, refuse to eat and they continuously lose weight, but they still perceive themselves to be overweight. So this woman, um, this is prior to treatment. You can see just how thin she was. She actually felt that she was overweight, even at this stage. And here she is later after getting some treatment. The very common symptoms, obviously, is excessive weight loss. Um, you'll see that these individuals just don't eat enough. They're doing self-starvation. They're very preoccupied with foods and food restrictions and categories of foods. Um, they have a lot of anxiety about gaining weight or being fat. They deny that they're hungry at any time. Uh, they have constant excuses to avoid meal times, and they tend to have a very a, a, um, a rigid exercise regimen to burn off calories. It also can be very isolating where they withdraw from their regular friends. Anorexia has huge impacts on uh, various body systems. Um, it leads to mood swings, anxiety, and depression, as far as the brain is concerned. It has all kinds of effects on hair and skin. It has a huge effect on the heart. It can lead to very poor circulation, and this tends to be one of the major problems leading to death amongst uh, women and men who have anorexia. Um, and there are other factors as well. Uh, bone loss is another big one too, because of loss of bone calcium. So it's, a, and muscle fatigue and muscle loss as well. Uh, it's a very serious condition, um, and you know it definitely is something that requires uh, significant treatment. Obesity is another form. Of, uh, of an issue related to weight and weight gain. Uh, this is, it's characterized as being um, excessively overweight. Um, obesity increases the risk for, for many health issues such as cardiovascular diseases, hy hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, back and neck problems, a lot of different things that come along with obesity. It's a, something that's a scale issue. So individuals maybe have relatively low risk of obesity, um, and then there's a range. Some people are overweight, and that's an issue, but not technically obese uh, based on their body mass index. Then there's some threshold in which then people are considered obese, but then it can go up from there, and these risks go up uh, directly proportional to the degree to which one is obese. So severely obese individuals um, are great at, uh, have the highest risk of these health issues and are more likely to have major health problems or die from their conditions. <clears throat> so the risk of death dramatically increases with progressively increased body mass index, index BMI. Um, this is particularly true in men. So this is showing the different range of BMIs. This is just a number scale that's used to look at your overall height and your uh, your body mass. And there's a point at which there's, um, so actually really relatively low levels, there's a relatively high risk. So there's a sweet spot of normal weight. You can see it's a relatively large range, but as soon as you start to get above around 30 BMI, um, the uh, that's when you've got uh, increased risk of death. And as you get higher and higher, the rest the risk gets higher and higher. And, um, uh, and you can see that um, there's a divergence, both for men and women, it's, um, there's an increased risk of death, but for men, it increases even higher. Some of, obviously, changes in obesity includes changes in adipose tissue. And adipose tissue can change in two ways. You can have, um, so adipose tissue is made up of fat cells. You can have, um, Fat cell hypertrophy, which means that the fat cells get, they increase in size. So some of these fat cells can actually be some of the biggest cells in the body. They can get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's called fat cell hypertrophy. There's also something called fat cell hyperplasia. Hyperplasia just means an increase in number of cells. So you can also have an increase in cell number as well. Um, the... Uh, this is a, an illustration of some of these differences. 
and you can see, so this is showing um, what fat cells look like from someone who is relatively obese. The cells are bigger compared to someone who is a normal individual. You can see the cells are smaller. Um, so fat cells definitely can, can change in size. And you can see it's like almost double or even bigger um, when uh, an individual is obese. Both of these things happening um, can be a problem, but when you have hyperplasia, that can be an especially a, a difficult problem. So this is the issue of when you have gained weight, it can be hard to lose it. And that's because you have cell division happening and those cells are very hard to lose. So the cells can get smaller, but they will still occupy space because cells can only get so small. And therefore losing weight, once you have gained a bunch of weight and added fat cells, it can be very, very hard. So fat cells, um, they can change in uh, number over time. And there are three major phases in which the total number of fat cells changes over our lives. Uh, we have um, in your last, the last trimester of pregnancy in the first year of life and adolescence. These are, uh, so when a baby is born, they got the big old baby cheeks um, and big old pudgy thighs. Uh, you ever seen a little newborn infant? They, they look all sort of like pudgy and lumpy. That's because they've had, um, that's one of those phases in which they've had a huge increase in the number of fat cells that are being produced. Then in the first year of life, uh, around between 12 and 18 months, um, new toddlers tend to get very plump and chubby and very cute as well. Um, and that's another phase in which we're just adding fat cells. And then prior to puberty is another phase in which many of us, um, nearly all of us have gone through um, at that point to where there's a, a plumpingness that occurs right before puberty tend to get a little bit plump. You can see it in the face, you get some rolls. And then once puberty hits for both boys and girls, there tends to be some weight loss that occurs at that point. Again, fat cells can increase in size. They can be two to three times their, their size and the number can increase as well. So at normal, there's usually about 30 to 40 billion uh, fat cells in the body. But when an individual becomes obese, the size increases and the number of cells increasing, it can get to as big as 75 billion, so nearly a doubling of the number of cells. When you lose weight, again, the, the fat cells shrink to a smaller size, but the number remains the same. And it just makes it very hard to lose weight because now you have all these cells, these excess cells, and, um, and they can only get so small. Genetics is another factor that can influence how much an individual eats and their overall weight gain. It is not the only factor, social, societal, family issues, and um, overall emotional states can have a huge influence on uh, overall obesity. Of course, some of those things are genetically influenced, um, but this is an issue that tends to not be um, di directly related to any one particular gene for most individuals. But there are examples of individuals who have had mutations that is clearly related then to um, obesity. So this is an example of two mice um, that have the same mutation. They are have a mutation that is defective for the, the hormone leptin. So these mice are unable to produce leptin. Leptin is this hormone that's produced by fat that it will get up to the brain and it will induce the POMC cart neurons to become activated. And then that will increase um, feelings of satiety and then you'll stop eating. Animals that do not have leptin don't get a normal satiety signal and they tend to overeat and they will be huge, giant fat mice. Uh, when I first started my PhD at the University of Washington, I worked in a lab that worked on the hypothalamus and the hormones involved in regulating um, feeding behavior and leptin is one of the things that they worked on. So they had some of these mice. These mice are so fat that um, they're unable to clean themselves. So mice, they defecate obviously, and normally they can just kind of clean themselves and it's usually not a big deal. For the mice that are leptin deficient, they get so fat that they can't even reach behind and clean themselves. So every single day, 
uh, a technician, usually an undergraduate, had to go in and clean the backsides of these mice. So they had to go in, pick up each mouse, and wipe down the backside because they were unable to do it. It's pretty distressful. Um, however, these mice are missing the leptin, but if you inject them with leptin, now they are getting uh, the satiety signal and they can shed a huge amount of weight. So by providing leptin, you can do and induce this change. This is this has been one, um, the idea of, of treating people with leptin has been one idea of trying to uh, um, affect and um, treat obesity in humans. It hasn't exactly panned out because most individuals who are obese, they may have issues with how they're regulating leptin, but it's not due to some sort of leptin mutation. There are examples though in humans, and this is a picture of one child who had this issue. So um, this is a boy, a picture taken when he was three years old, and he weighed 42 kilograms at this point. And that's like a little under a hundred pounds at the age of three, he nearly weighed a hundred pounds. This is a picture of the same boy uh, just four years later, and he had dropped 10 kilograms from the age of three. He'd lost 10 kilograms growing from age three to age seven. And it's because this boy has the same mutation that these mice do. So he was missing the gene for leptin. This was identified and he could get injections with leptin um, so after eating, you'd have to get an injection treatment with leptin, and it then provides the satiety signal that he needs. And you can see he has overall normal body weight, um, you know, looking very normal and healthy. So there are examples of this. And, um, and that's, of course, an issue. Now, the other thing I want you to keep in mind uh, for this is that leptin also has to act on a leptin receptor, right? The leptin receptor... Uh, is located in the POM C cart neurons. Um, so think through leptin treatment and how that would affect an individual who is has a mutation for leptin receptor. What would happen? As I mentioned at the outset, our feelings about eating and um, our emotional states overeating is not always going to be just directly related to whatever activity is happening within the hypothalamus. There are all kinds of experiential and um, cognitive influences over how we think about food and how we eat. So when I say cognitive, this is our active thinking process involved with this. This is our perception of food, the sensory inputs, taste, odor, two of the, the, the five main senses that we've talked about playing a very important role. The visual aspect of, of food, you know, if you're at Thanksgiving dinner, um, if it's done remotely this year, but you might see a picture of a turkey and you'll see that delicious turkey and just seeing it and uh, just that alone make, can make you hungry, um, even if it's done remotely. But of course, being at the table and having the taste and odors there, those things that you have experienced in the past are going to be big parts of it as, as well. Early childhood eating habits has a big shape on it. So uh, of, of our thoughts and feelings around food, if you grow up in a family that um, uh, has relatively healthy attitudes towards food, lots of vegetables and fruits, not as many sweets, that tends to have an effect of having norm, um, healthy eating habits as an adult. But if you grow up in a household where you have lots of sweets all the time and you don't eat very healthy, those individuals are more likely to struggle or struggle with weight gain as adults. Food preferences just can vary. Um, you know, some people just don't like certain kinds of foods. And of course, cultural influences will have a big role as well. So, um, you know, individuals from various uh, backgrounds where they have certain types of cuisines will have an influence over weight gain and loss uh, as adults as well. So those will be major factors that, you know, clearly are not rooted in biology, but the overall culture that one comes from. The emotional state obviously will play a role as well. The, uh, um, you know, food acts to reward our, uh, and it can activate the reward system in our brain. 
as well as activate the discuss system. And um, so, you know, certainly most of us, when we eat sweets or we eat a delicious pizza, or in my case, um, I don't know if, uh, if any of you have ever been to Chicago, but if you go, Chicago is known for their Italian beefs. This is kind of a specialized sandwich that you can find in Chicago, and it's hard to find in um, really any other place. Um, one of the more famous restaurants from Chicago is called Portillo's that su uh, sells these. They sell hot dogs and they sell Italian beefs. And it's this shaved, like spicy, thin beef on this delicious, uh, like Italian baguette. And sometimes it's covered with cheese or with what's called giardinara, which is a uh, um, kind of like a pickled uh, jalapeno and carrots and other vegetables. It is delicious. And it's, uh, clearly for me, um, I see this, I grew up with this kind of thing and I will tend to overeat because of my overall experience with these, uh, having grown up in Chicago. I encourage you to get, uh, an Italian beef if you're in Chicago. Um, these will activate my reward systems, uh, for sure. Just the sight of it does. Um, I'm salivating just looking at this. But the, uh, you know, humans, um, if I were to eat this, it would be, um, I, I would have to have a very strong satiety signal to, to knock down my desire to eat Italian beefs. The disgust system obviously is part of that too. Just seeing a banana for me can make me feel very, very sick. And this obviously will have an influence over my overall emotional state. Negative emotions can have an influence as well. So it's for those of us struggling with stress and anxiety around the pandemic, many of us may be feeling fear, sadness, anger. This can disrupt eating. For some of us, it might mean that you don't eat as much. For others, such as myself, uh, tend to overeat. And uh, yeah, so that's one way of, of managing uh, fear and emotion that it clearly has an impact on our overall eating habits. Um, stressful situations, you know, oftentimes you'll find like say during finals week or studying for this class um, that you might, um, you know, have to struggle with, with eating, right? And uh, you might overeat during that time, some partly because of just time pressure, but also just because of the stress that you're in. So here's some key questions about appetite uh, related to hormones. Um, we talked about the different subdivisions within the hypothalamus, the lateral hypothalamus, the ventral medial hypothalamus, and the arcuate. Those are the three main areas that we really focused on. Um, you should really know the role of these two different categories in the arcuate nucleus and their influence over hunger and their influence over each other. Where is ghrelin, orexin, PYY, and leptin made? And how does it regulate, um, and what are the factors that regulate their level of synthesis? And how do they influence feeding behavior? Where do they act in the brain? What are the subcategories of neurons in the arcuate that they influence? Think about through the mutations of leptin and leptin signaling. And how would a mutation for leptin differ for a mutation for leptin receptor, for instance? What is taste aversion? And then of course, we talked about some of the uh, issues around eating disorders, anorexia being one that we spent a, a fair amount of time talking about because it's such a serious issue. So you should know some of the details around our anorexia. So that's it. Hopefully you get uh, something nice to eat today and we will see you next time.